chapter 5. Uh, Barry, nothing's on up there. Okay. Um, I'm, yeah, but you don't have to turn it on loud. Just make sure the system's on. I think it's automatically on the internet anyway. So that's, that's the people that will email me and saying it didn't work. It didn't go on the internet. So. Yes, but I want to make sure because the green light's on. All right. Um, wow. And let there be light. Yeah, th that one's good. The, the communion light's good. All right. Amos chapter 5. Uh, we're going to pick up in a, kind of towards the beginning of it. Kind of backtrack just a little bit and go forward. We're in the, where Amos is talking about Israel's future. They're, they're, God is calling down judgment through the prophet. So let's pray and we'll begin class. Father, what a gracious thing we have tonight that we have heat within this building. We have the building to be used, but most of all that we have your word to be absorbed, to be taken into our lives, to be understood that you have a, a plan and that you are a God who oversees what happens, a God who forewarns and, and then pours out his grace. And thank you for this book of Amos in Jesus name. Amen. Um, Again, what we're seeing here is Amos is uh, being a good prophet. A prophet is to foretell and foretell. Um, so he's going through the northern kingdom where he's not very well loved or liked. And we saw from last week, he can be pretty um, blunt with people. And what, he's, what we see, and we're picking up in uh, chapter 5, verse 4, and we're dealing with Israel's future. That's kind of, I think I went through 4 and 5. Last week, and I just want to read those to get context um, and deal with verse 6. That's where we'll kind of pick up tonight. So it says, Thus says the Lord, Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live. So God is saying this first idea. He's saying, You seek me so that you may live. Uh, but do not resort to Bethel or, and do not come to Gilgal, nor cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal will certainly go into captivity. And Bethel will come to trouble. And those were basically uh, hubs for the idolatry. Then now Amos says, seek the Lord that you may live. So Amos is repeating the same thing God had already said. Um, and that's what pretty much what a prophet did is, is tell you what God said. Lest he break forth like fire, O house of Joseph, and it consume with none uh, to quench it for Bethel. So again, what, what he's doing is, is spouting forth how judgment will come. And, and I, wa I want you to understand when he says fire will come down, again, it's saying that judgment is definitely to come. Judgment will uh, come in its completeness. How's that? It, notice how what it says, that fire will break forth and it will consume. So it's, it, the judgment will be complete. Uh, and no one can put it out. No one can end it. It's not something man can control. It's coming from God. Verse 7 says... For those who turn justice into wormwood and cast righteousness down to the earth. Now, again, the idea of judgment is, uh, is the idea of God carrying out his justice. God is doing it because God is just and righteous and his holiness demands that his justice gets carried out. Um, but notice what it says. It says wormwood. It's a bitterness. It's grief. The wormwood is used for medicine. Um, when I was a kid, all medicines tasted like medicine. Now it tastes like Grape juice and cherry and all this stuff that they do with medicines today. Um, it almost says, hey, man, that's like drinkable. Drink the whole thing. But when we were kids, you know, your mother would threaten. I don't know if any of you ever got threatened with, I'm going to give you castor oil. And the first thing that you'd say, oh, no, I would just, never mind, I'll die. But that's the idea behind this wormwood. It's, bad, it's, it's bitter medicine. So Israel's going to be taking uh, and getting their bitter medicine, medicine. And then the idea of cast righteousness. It's an idiom that means for righteousness is stumped, out, uh, stumped on, stomped on or, or, or done away with. Righteousness is not a goal of the people. Remember what God wanted is his people to be right with him and to have his righteousness. And it's not even a goal for the people. It's not even in their scope of things as we look at verse 6 uh, and, and in verse 7. At the end of that, he says, it will cast it down to the earth. Now, now not throw it out down, to the, but stomp on it. 
cast it down. So idolatry was one reason for judgment. And now another reason for judgment is how they looked at God's justice and righteousness. They, they, they were idolatrous. They had scorned God. They didn't treat Him as God. And now what they're doing is saying, now God's attributes of justice and righteousness, they don't matter either. So God didn't matter in any parts of their life. I, I just want you to see how the northern kingdom had so uh, strayed from God. And when, when Amos is cutting it straight with them, um, they, they're getting the message. They're, here's the interesting thing, and one of the things that kind of been, keeps constantly coming up to me. It's amazing how you could talk to people. You can almost convince them of their standing with God or, or their understanding with God. And they'll look away and they say, okay, that's fine for you, but it's not for me. Or they'll say, okay, and, and, and they don't care. They're indifferent. They're apathetic to it. And people don't seem to listen. They don't want to take biblical advice. And that's really a bad place to be because here's these people who have the prophet from God speaking to them. And instead of pursuing righteousness um, as a way of life, they abandon it uh, to the ground. They basically treated it like dirt. And, and God had given them everything uh, that was necessary. I, Romans, hold your finger here real quick. And this just thought came to my mind. Go to Romans chapter 9. Hold your finger. We'll go right back to Amos. I just want to, before I tell you what the, the uh, sage said about verse 7, which is kind of interesting. And I will refer sometimes when we're in these Old Testament studies to some of the sages, because this is how the Jewish interpreters understood it. Doesn't mean they were right, but it's kind of interesting to get their insight sometimes. Um, a lot of times they're right. They do understand how to interpret. They just don't apply any of it sometimes. Romans chapter 9 says this, though. And Paul is talking uh, to, to the church at Rome. And he's, now he's kind of taking an a interlude. And he says um, in verse 1, I am telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bearing witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. I could wish that myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brother and my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Here's what they have. Who are Israelites. That means that basically they were the children of God, the very people that were allowed in the very presence of God. To whom belongs the adoption as sons, the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Whose are the fathers from whom is the Messiah, not the Christ, whom is the Messiah, uh, Messiah, according to the flesh, who is overall God blessed forever. So here's their list of, uh, of attributes, their credentials as a nation that they had. And go back to Amos with that idea. This is what God had for them the whole time. And they treated that as all dirt. It didn't matter. It didn't matter what God had done for them. It didn't matter their uh, station in life, I guess you could say. it. It's like you were born a prince and you wanted to live like a pauper. And you thought it was all right. And when somebody said you're a prince and this is your kingly line, you said, no, I don't care. And you spat on it. You say, that's ridiculous. But that's what these people did. Um, remember, they were a nation called out to be God's people. And they were not, they, you couldn't uh, separate them from the pagan people at this time. You couldn't tell the difference. God wanted them to have a, a way to tell that they were people of God. And you couldn't tell. Here's what the sage says about verse 7 of chapter 5 of Amos. The people had reacted to the sweetness of Torah, or sweetness of the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, or God's Word, however you want to put it. So the people had reacted to the sweetness of God's Word and its ways of justice and righteousness as if they were bitter medicines in their mouth. Now, can you, can you kind of look at that? I mean, we're here tonight studying the Bible, and, and it's not bitter to us, but there's, some, there's many people that you start telling them, here's what the Word of God says, and, and all of a sudden you can see they're getting bitter. You can see what's happening with them. Uh, verse 8 says, He who made the Pleiades and the Orion and change, changes uh, deep darkness into morning, who also darkens day into night, who calls from waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is His name. Now, here's what, the, what, what the, uh, Amos is going to. He's going to the account that God is in control. How do we know God's in control of everything? Well, you look up at the stars at night, and they have a certain pattern, and they will always keep that certain pattern, and we use that to tell seasons and times. And God's the one who put them there. God's the one who establishes them there. And God's the one who keeps them there. Um, uh, it's interesting. 
what Amos is basically saying, you know, God's creator, do you realize who you're dealing with? You ever kind of talk to somebody and you're doing business with somebody and you go, you realize who you're doing business with? I'm a this or I'm a that and, and I have this kind of status in the community and you've got to be leery of who you're dealing with. You know, be careful. Um, so Amos is saying, be careful. Not only is the creator, because he, he's controlling, all, he, he's made all and he keeps them where they're at. Uh, ever, ever sit down and think how many stars are there? Do you know on a given night how many stars there are? Sit and count them. I think at one, one time when we had a, uh, science started developing the telescopes, they said there were 5,000 stars up there. Know how many stars they kind of count today with the ability to count stars? They're in, innumerable. They, they've got it over millions of billions. They, they just can't count them. Because as deep as they can see with their telescopes, there's still yet more. So... Um, and God put them all in a specific place, in a specific rotation, in a specific orbit. And that's who you're dealing with. You're dealing with that creator. But it also says you're, he's sovereign in this verse. He's the one that he can call into darkness and night. He's the one that calls the waters in, uh, from the seas. Uh, there's nothing beyond his control. Then it goes at the end. It says, and remember, his name is Yahweh. Uh, it basically says Yahweh Shem. Which is interesting, because here's what the Hebrews call God today. They call Him Hashem. Okay, listen to what I'm saying. It says here in this verse, it says Yahweh Shem. The Hebrews today call Him Hashem. So they replace the word Yahweh, the very specific name of God, with the word Ha, H-A. H-A means, ready for this? The. So they replace God's name with the word the. So God is now called Hashem, which means the name. Because they won't say the name, so they say the name. That's who he is. He's the name. Okay, but I want you to say, when they understood the name was Yahweh, that carried a, a, a large impact. The people of God understood that name from the time of Moses onward. Or get where Moses would ask God, what, what shall I tell, the, who shall I tell... Tell the people sent me. Um, verses 9, 9 says this. It is he who flashes forth with destruction upon the strong. So that destruction comes upon the fortress. Again the rise and fall of nations under, are under his control. So when we see nations rise and fall. God is in control. I didn't say anything nasty. That kid should not have gone off. Tell her to, just tell her stop. See that's all you have to do. Uh, verses 10 through 13. I have such a nice way with children. Stop. Uh, verse 10 says, They hate him who reproves in the gate. They abhor him who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and exact tribute of grain from them, though you have built houses of well-hewn stone, yet you will not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, yet you will not drink from their wine. For I know your transgressions are many and your sins are great. You, you who distressed... Uh, the righteous and accept bribes and turn aside the poor in the gate. Again, these are Israel's uh, sins, Israel maladjustments to God. Here's what they kind of delineate them real quick. Verse 10 basically says, the prophets have spoken, they don't listen. The prophets have spoken, they don't listen. They've rejected anything that has to do with the word of God. Ever meet anybody like that? You can say, I'm a Christian, that's fine, it's good for you, that's whatever floats your boat. And you say, well, here's what I learned today from the Bible. And they'll say, up, oh, that's it. That's it. We're gone. Conversation over. Um, but that these are the people of God that should have been listening to the prophets, and they had nothing to do with them. Verse eleven, basically, they're okay. First of all, verse ten, they're maladjusted spiritually because they're not listening to the prophets. Verse ten, they would be maladjusted economically because look what they how they treated people. Look how they treated the poor. They they imposed heavy rent on them. It was beyond their ability to pay. Um, and, and they actually um, had great joy in doing so. Uh, and, ver and verse 12 basically says they were morally maladjusted because it says, it, it, which is interesting, I know your transgressions are many and your sins are great. So again, God understands where they're at and how they uh, um, have misaligned to him and don't care. And he's just saying, here's sin upon sin upon sin upon sin. And at some point, he's going to say, 
That's it. We're done. And that's where we're at because verse 13 is, Therefore, therefore, uh, at, su- at such a time the prudent person keeps silent, for, it's, for it is evil time. So here's what happens in this time period. People are getting so bad, but the people that know the right, the people that know how to do the right, um, are, are silenced. Uh, uh, it's interesting because it's in the Hiphel stem, because not only are they keeping silent, they've been caused to be silent. What is their cause for silence? Well, look how they're, the people in their nation have behaved. There, are always, there is always a remnant that are around. And as you look, um, you could say, man, um, we just need to just keep our mouth shut. We're, it's not going to do any good anymore to speak to these people. It's not going to be good. There is a time for all of us to be silent. And there's a time to speak. I think Solomon says that well in Ecclesiastes. There's a time to do everything. And here we see the time for them to be uh, quiet. Uh, verse 14 through 15, Israel's only hope is seek good and not evil uh, that you may live. So Israel needs to come back to God and the purpose is to seek good. And thus the Lord God of hosts be with you just as you have said. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So again, uh, the focus of the prophet is there's a time for this, um, which is interesting because there, in this section is three basic commands. Seek good. And here he goes back to that word again. He's going to use that word, seek it, uh, uh, which is fascinating because he's used the same word three times in three different ways. It's the same word, but he's used it three different ways. First time he says, the Lord has said, seek him. Then he, Amos, says, seek the Lord. Now he's telling them to seek what is good. And it all comes down to the same idea. Um, seek what's good. That's not worldly understanding. Seek what's good. You can, under, you can kind of grasp this because it says seek good, not evil. What's evil? The things of Satan. So the things that are good are the things of God. The things of Satan are of this world. Isn't Satan the prince of this world? The things of God... The good is the things not of this world that God only can provide. So there's the, there's the kind of the balance in that verse 14. and verse 15, it basically says, hate evil, love good. So now he's kind of reversed the order a little bit. And he says, again, it's, it's a command. Uh, it's interesting. In the Hebrew, know what the word for hate is here? Ready for this? It's the word sane. Because we kind of flip it, don't we? Don't we say... You must be insane doing that. But the Hebrew word for hate is sane, or, or, or we would say sane. That's how we would pronounce it, sane. But we would write it sane, S-A-N-E. Um, the idea here, again, is hate that which is evil. Um, love the good. Um, then he go, then he, and that word love, again, is, is a command. So you can be commanded to do those things. And then the command number four is to establish justice in the gate. Um, again, what does God want? He wants things to be just, and He will keep uh, carry that justice that's going on. Uh, there's, you know, there's different places you could be spiritually. You could be uh, spiritually attuned to be a very spiritual person and listen to God and adhere to God's word and be obedient. You could be uh, apathetic to it where it really doesn't matter you could be agnostic to it um, but these people are so far from where they should have been there isn't a category really to put them in Um, there is no where they're at there is no return and that's basically where they're at judgment is very close at hand It, for, here's just a thought I put on this verse, and let me kind of read it to you, and we'll kind of discuss it. It is not enough to, to, to not pursue evil. It's not enough to refrain from evil. Rather, one is to despise it entirely, love only which is good, establish justice, despise injustice. When people come to you, justice is what they deserve, just as the Lord is dealing with you. And the, and the idea here is... Um, we can't really go around 
as we look at people and say, well, it's okay for them. They're allowed to do that stuff. No, if it's evil, we've got to call it what it is. But still love the person. And that's a real hard balance to get. Because there's a lot of things that are happening in our society that we would say biblically, that's just evil. But it doesn't mean we don't love the people. Yes. Go ahead. From way back, I hope I can hear you. Yes. I can speak loud. I, really? Use your teacher voice. Go ahead. Right, which is? They're doing the evil. It's evil. But they can't love that. They got to hate that. Do you understand? Yes. Well, well and, and honestly, to answer your question, if they're doing the evil, they are sinning, right? Yes. Okay. But, they, but at this point, where, where we want to see, if anything, is that they're not, they, they are being told constantly that they need to come back to God, return to God. What did it say in chapter 4? Remember we said in chapter 4, you have not returned to me, you have not returned to me. Well, well by the time you get to chapter 5, I don't think it's a point they can do that. So they're evil. They've done the evil, they've become the evil. There's not a point of return if you get what I'm saying. Um, that's from what I'm getting out of the text. Um, I always think, and my, my firmest belief is, if you're still alive, you've still got a chance. <laughs> but I really think at some point, God does say he's done. Uh, for instance, a good, a good example coming from the top of my head. Um, God knew before the uh, incident with Pharaoh and Moses' time in the Exodus, he knew that Pharaoh would harden his heart. But he says to Moses... Before the plagues, he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. You kind of think, wait a second, you're going to make him do that? But if we look at the individual plagues, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And you kind of say, well, at some point, Pharaoh has the ability to stop this pattern. Then all of a sudden it says, and God hardened his heart. And I don't believe at that point, Pharaoh could change the pattern. God had sealed his fate. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? That kind of place, that some place, there's a place, and only God knows it when that person has no chance anymore. Um, but I look at it like this, as long as you're alive, you have that ability to be uh, repentant, to come back to God, to turn to God. But I hear, here's what he's saying, is that the, the nation had so built up a list, I think, Sam, which will help you a little bit. Going back to that verse, he knows your transgressions and your many sins. They had so piled them up, and not dealt with them, and not come back around, and not realize who they are. They, they were unidentifiable from the heathen people that had no ability to know where they were at. So maybe that would helps a little bit more to identify what's going on. Um, uh, and, and remember, we sin because we're sinners. But in order to get right, we've got to know that God will deal with our sin, and God uh, reaches out in forgiveness. Here we're dealing with, though, is a national... Uh, again, a national identity of it, not an individual. It's a national thing. Um, verse 16 says this, and we're going to pick up with a different section now, a little bit different. We're still dealing with a little bit of Israel's future, but the effects of their disregard for the Lord's commands. Now we're going to get into the other side of it. They have so disregarded the Lord's command. Um, remember, all this stems off of the, uh, the Torah of Moses, the five books of Moses, and the law that Moses said, if you do these things, God will bless you. If you don't do these, God will curse you. And da, da, da. So now they have had a total disregard for God's commands and his obedience. Um, and let me think if I can find it. Hang on one second. I got a verse that I think that kind of helps when they were coming out of the exile. Um, Ezra chapter 7. If you want to turn with me. Ugh, that's a longer chapter than I thought. <laughs> Uh, somewhere in here it talks about Ezra. If somebody wants to help me find it in Ezra, I know it's Ezra chapter 7, um, where it talks about Ezra studying, uh, and the purpose of his studying is to be obedient. Uh, and it's not jumping off the page. So if, if and maybe we don't need to chase that rabbit because I can't find it. Uh, yeah, here it is. It's uh, verse 25.
uh, and 26. The end of 25 says this, Even all those who, who know the laws of your God, you may teach anyone who is ignorant of them. Whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of your king, let judgment be executed upon him strictly, whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of goods or for imprisonment. So basically, it, even in Ezra's time, there was a repercussion, a consequence for your interaction with the, with, with, with the words of God. Um, and, and, and again, uh, what we're seeing here is those consequences. So back to Amos chapter 5, verse 16 says, Therefore says the Lord God of hosts, the Lord, there is wailing in all the palaces, uh, plazas and in all the streets, they say, alas, alas. They also call the farmer of, uh, to mourning and the professional mourners to lamentation. And in all the vineyards there is wailing because I will pass through the midst of you, says the Lord. So what we have here is a picture of universal suffering. A consequence is everybody's in mourning. Even the professional mourners have taken it up a grade. Um, if you don't know what a professional mourner is, if you died and you didn't have enough relatives to cry over your body, your relatives would hire out people to mourn and cry over your casket so there could be a, uh, a larger group of mourners. And well. We kind of see that in New Orleans. Don't they do that kind of thing in New Orleans? That's kind of cool. Uh, I mean, it's kind of weird, but cool. But they have professional mourners and, and, and uh, carry that. But at this time, it was, it was uh, wailing was everywhere. So it was, what it's basically saying is because of God's passing through, there is going to be universal suffering. 18 through 20, uh, we're going back to that thought of Joel. Uh, it's, it's, and you are longing for the day of the Lord. It had gotten so bad. Lord, just come. Judge already. That's what they're saying. Um, for the purpose... Uh, for what purpose will the day of the, will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light. So, so what Amos is saying is, you want the day of the Lord to come, and you you want it to come quickly. But what good is it for you if it comes? Because it's only going to judge you. It's not going to bring you the kingdom. Because remember what we said in Joel, they were looking for the always talk about the day of the Lord because you'll be ushered into the kingdom. But what good? These people won't be going there. Uh, as when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him. Or goes home, leans his hand against the wall, and a snake bites him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with not with no brightness in it? So again, the, the, what's happened is uh, the repercussions of the of of their sin have led to um, basically there's no escape. That's what we, we're down to. They're running from a lion only to meet a bear. They run from the bear only to meet a snake. I mean, there's nowhere you can go. It's kind of, kind of thing. Um, here's what the sages say, and again, I'm going to every once in a while I'm going to interject these things. The day of the Lord was a day of salvation for the Jewish people in the end of days. This is what the sages are saying. Very accurate. Uh, that will occur only when they are righteous and follow the ways of Torah. Um, what they didn't understand is the way they gain that righteousness is through their Messiah. Uh, however, as long as you persist in your present behavior, the day of the Lord's glory will be one of darkness and gloom for you with not light of salvation in its wake, which is fascinating. I'm saying these guys almost got it and they don't believe they almost got it. They're, they're very uh, attu attuned to what the verse is saying. Um, a Jewish antidote says this, which is about this idea. Uh, there were a bat and a rooster were, wa were waiting uh, the dawn, the rooster crowed at the bat. I await the light because the light is mine. But you, why do you seek the light? In other words, what good is a bat going to do when the light comes? He can't see anything anyway. And that's what Israel's at. Israel's at the place that they, they don't see the light. Remember what Jesus said when he came, right? I am the light of the world. They had acknowledged the light, and they didn't. They refused it. They'd rather live in, what does it say? They, they, they loved the darkness rather than the light. Uh, why would Israel remain in the darkness? For they love the darkness more than the light. Verse 21 through 26. Verse 21 through 26. Uh, again, um, what comes about is a total rejection of their rituals and festivals. Now, Israel's calendar... Their life was set on rituals and calendar and festival days that God had given them, but it was to be served with celebration and memorial, not with um, 
Actually, what had, done, had happened by this time, too, they had taken their festivals and attributed them to the pagan gods, too. So it says in verse 21, I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and with grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not even look at your peace offerings of your fatlings. So in other words, they were doing what they were uh, told to do, but they weren't doing it with the right mental attitude behind them. Uh, take away from me the noise of your songs. In other words, even their praises that were lifting up uh, was not from the heart. It was just the uh, ritual of doing it. I, I will not even listen to you, the sound of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a f- ever-flowing stream. Did, did you present me with your sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel? In other words, what did you do in the wilderness? What was the attitude of the nation? Again, what, what always happens in the Bible, and you've got to get, get this uh, a very important fact, that they go back to the historical event where it all started in the Exodus, and they re- recount to them what God had done. Uh, verse 26, you also carried along uh, Sikoth, your king, and Ki- Kinyon, your, your images. And basically, uh, Kinyon was an image or a pillar of the heathen god. Sikoth was a, 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 a Babylonian god. So there was basically, he, they, they made that Babylonian god their king, and they set up heathen images. That's what they did in this time that they were supposed to be worshiping God. This, it says, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Um, no wonder, here's what you should see. When I'm reading this, um, I'm thinking God is mad as hell and is not going to take it anymore. That's kind of what you should get. Because that's the feeling that you, that you should uh, get and pull away from this. Because when you get to verse 27, uh, 27, it says, Therefore, I will make you go into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of armies. I know it says God of hosts, but that means God of armies. God is marching through with them. He's the, basically, uh, and again, I'm going to say this redundantly, but he's done. It's time's up. Their, their, their clock for God's long suffering is run out, run out. Chapter 6 is a list of decrees. Um, and you know, right away, there's trouble when the first word is woe. You know, if anybody's ever read Matthew, we know that the list of woes that Jesus pronounced against the Pharisees were not good. So when God begins here, as, as Jesus did in Matthew, woe is not good. Uh, uh, and it's interesting what, they, what he does. He says, woe to those who are in ease in Zion and to those who feel secure in the mountain of Samaria, the distinguished men of the foremost nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Kalna. Ke- Ke- and look, go from there to Hamath the Great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are they better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than yours? And what he's basically doing is saying he's challenging them to look past their borders. See what's going on. Um, what's happening to the enemies and the people around them? Uh, and Israel had looked around. And what was their idea was... It wasn't that we were better off than these people and that we had God. They wanted to be like them. How many times did you see in the Bible that Israel looked around and they said, hey, you know, I really want to be like the Smiths and Jones. You know, I want to be like these pagan guys. I want, we want to have a God like them and a king like them and carved images like them. And they took him in. And, and what the uh, prophet here is, is saying to him is, go ahead, look around, see what, see what they're like. Challenge you with that. Um, verses 3 through 6, do not put off the day of calamity. And would you bring near the seat of violence, those who recline in the beds of ivory and sprawl on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves in the midst of the stall, who improvise to the sound of the harp and like David have composed songs for themselves, who drink wine from sacrificial bowls while they anoint themselves with the finest oils. Yet they have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. So here's what's going on. They've been indulgent, self, self-centered indulgent people. Look what they've done for themselves. They're feasting. They're stretching out lazily on couches. They're listening to wonderfully enchanting music. They're drinking wine in abundance. In, in, and notice what it says. They're drinking wine in the sacrificial bowls. <laughs> uh, these were the bowls that the priests would use to take the blood of the animal and sprinkle them on the altar. 
you kind of get what the picture is? And they're taking and putting wine in it and, and drinking it. Um, so they don't care. They really don't care about anything. Uh, they anointed themselves with rich perfumes. But therefore is there again. Um, verse 7 says, Therefore they will go and to go into exile at the head of their exiles, and the sprawlers' banqueting will pass away. Uh, the Lord God has sworn, and the end of it will be like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread. Ready for this? Not a famine for thirst of water, but rather for hearing the words of God. That's a pretty, a pretty grim picture that's painted. They will have a physical famine. But what did Jesus say even to uh, Satan in Matthew chapter 4? He says, what we need is not to turn the rocks, uh, the stones into bread, but that we live by every word out of the mouth of God. That's our bread. And they don't have that very living bread. Uh, that's what he's basically saying. Uh, they have nothing left but just fragments of what they could possibly have. And it says, and people will stagger from sea to sea from the, oops, I've skipped the whole chapter. Where am I at? Why didn't somebody say something? Boy, I skipped. Wow. Hold that off for later. Somebody should have said something. Okay. We're in chapter, I'm in chapter six now, verse, verse, verse uh, nine, I'm going to pick up. And if you be, don't, for, everything I said is good for later. <laughs> Verse 9 says, and it will be, if ten men were left in one house, they will die. Uh, uh, there, there's one uncle, and his undertaker will lift him up to carry his bones uh, from his house. And he will say to the one who is in the innermost part of his house, is anyone else with you? And the one will say, no one. Then the answer will say, keep quiet, for the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. For behold, the Lord is going to command uh, that the great house be smashed to pieces and the small house to fragments. And again, uh, it's, it's pretty bad. Everything's going to be leveled. No matter what you live in or what you have, it's going to be destroyed. Verse 12 says, Do horses run on rocks? Or, do, or does one plow them with oxen? Uh, yet you have turned justice into poison and fruit of righteousness into that wormwood. Again, we're back to that bitterness. Um, again, Amos is employing a very uh, solid logic again. Uh, and, and he says, what he's basically saying is, judgment at this time makes absolute sense. Israel has sinned, sinned greatly. They've piled sin upon sin. And their judgment is uh, poison, basically. So what judgment is to poison, in other words, Israel had changed judgment into oppression. They also entrusting its riches to gain extortion. The fruit of righteousness that they were to get would be wormwood. So they, they had poison and they had wormwood. Uh, and that's a pretty bad place to be again. Um, and verse 13 and 14 deal with the arrogance of the people. It says, um, And who, who, uh, you who rejoice in low debar and say, We have not uh, by our own strength taken, um, I think it's car- carnimim. For ourselves, for behold, I am going to raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts. And they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the brooks of Arabah. And again, uh, their arrogance, they were boasting about... Now, uh, before I get into the idea of boasting, remember Jeroboam II is, in, is the king over this domain at this time. He At this time, they have beaten everybody. They've had victories everywhere. They're very uh, secure in themselves. They have no thoughts um, of anybody coming in and taking them into captivity. They have no thinking that somebody's going to exile them and take them away. They're very secure, but sometimes that false security is in themselves. They're thinking what they've done. They're not in any position to give God any glory. They're not giving God any thought, and they're okay uh, I think that's a place where people often get sometimes. Look at the, the flow of things we've talked about. Their, their self-indulgences, their self-security. Their, what, what's their need for God? And you ever notice when somebody goes through a trubu- uh, very turbulent time, they want to call out for God? And right now we're seeing that they're very comfortable. Uh, 
But within 40 years of this writing, Tygoth Pileser III will put an end to their conference, will put an end to their status, will smash their homes, will destroy and decimate the land, and take them into captivity. So let's just, for a second, turn to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. And I just want to show you the verse that kind of goes with this. And Jeremiah also speaks about this. Jeremiah 5.15 Behold, I am bringing a nation against you from afar, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. Lord, It is an enduring nation and is an ancient nation, a nation whose language you do not know, nor can you understand what they say. So when Assyria comes in and takes them, how will they communicate with them? How will they understand what's happening? They're going to be so, um, there's a Yiddish word called flabungent. Basically means totally lost, absolutely clueless. Okay? And that's what these people will be when they're taken into captivity that God has told them about. All right, let's shift gears and get into the second and last section of Amos. We're going to look at the visions of Amos. This is chapter 7 through chapter 9, verse 10. The visions, he has five visions that God will give him. And basically how we know they're a vision, they all say, Thus the Lord God showed me. That's what he'll say. The Lord God showed me. There's five visions. I'm going to tell you what they are, and then we're going to go through them. And prayerfully, we can do it pretty quickly. There's going to be uh, verses 1 through 3 of chapter 7 is devouring devouring locusts. Uh, many times in prophecy, locusts come in. They are uh, a, a sign of a devastation of the land. Secondly, f- uh, verses 4 through 6 of chapter 7, we're going to have consuming fire. Verses 7 through 9 is a probing plumb line. Verse, uh, chapter 8, the whole chapter is about a basket of summer fruit. And chapter 9, 1 through 10 is the Lord standing on an altar. That's, these are the visions Amos sees. Um, now remember, th- these visions are all, all developed means by which God will punish the children of Israel for their consistent, continuous, unrepentant sin. So that's they're, all we're doing is looking at how God will punish the people and, ha- and the means by which he uses them. The, the first, um, first vision is 1 through 3. So let's at least get through the first vision tonight um, and, get, and get a kind of grasp of where we're going. Uh, you know, the well, first thing I looked at when I wanted to see the visions and look at them, were they progressive in nature? In other words, one get worse than the other. Not necessarily. But they do kind of, um, what's the best word, way to look at it? Balance each other and, and, and stack. In other words, you have the first one, the second one will just add to it a little bit, but they don't. In other words, one's not bigger than the other, but they all kind of add another point of dealing with Israel's horrific uh, use of who God is and non caring about their position and status and what they God had given them originally. So what we see here in verses 1 through 3, it says, Thus the Lord God showed me, and behold, he was forming a locust swarm when the spring crop began to sprout. And behold, the spring crop was after the king's mowing. And it came about when it had finished eating the vegetation of land that I said, Lord God, please pardon. How can Jacob stand? For he is small. The Lord changed his mind about this. It shall not be, said the Lord. Now here's what's happening. This this vision scene, and, and Amos is going to stand up against the vision. The vision is this, that the, um, the locusts are going to come, take the place. Um, what, what we have is usually there's two crops a year. The first part of the first pro- crop is given uh, to uh, the king and put in, his, put in his reserves for his. Um, the first Kings chapter 4 talks about that. It's given part of the first crop cuttings is basically uh, the IRS is calling. The IRS says, this is how much you owe. And you would mow your fields and you would give it to the IRS instead of sending them a check on April 15th. That's the kind of idea. Um, but the second mowing, uh, or second harvest, I guess is the best way to put it, is what you would gather, 
and you would put in your storehouses so you can survive the winter. I don't know about you all, but uh, Lizzie and I talked a couple of times, making sure we have enough stuff in case we get iced in, which hasn't happened this year, so that's pretty good. Um, and I don't think we're going to get it, but I shouldn't be a weatherman, so I'm not going to tell you, because they're not right either. But, um, but the idea is when the winter, winters were usually hard and, you, and the fields didn't produce anything in a very agricultural society, you stored things up. There was no food in the storehouses. So Amos intercedes in verse 2. Um, the lo- locust had consumed. The prophet himself intercedes. Um, the, there's many questions. Did these plagues actually, did this plague, this vision actually take place? In other words, God is going to pronounce a, 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 a judgment of these locusts. Did, will it occur in the end? Well, we see from other prophets, yes, it does. Um, but what we see is here Amos intercedes uh, to, to forgive the people. And what we have is that Lord changed his mind. The Lord showed mercy. Uh, and states that it shall not be at that time. In other words, for instance, a good way to understand this, Jonah didn't want to go into Nineveh. He was afraid Nineveh would repent and that God wouldn't punish them. But God did punish them, not that time. You understand? God does punish. He just delays it. Um, and again, what we have here is it, Amos pleads for the people. Um, God showed restraint. We must remember that God never uh, uh, that, that God ever works in accordance with His infinite holiness and absolute righteousness. When sin is present, God must condemn and punish it. When prayer and the grace of God operate to provide a way of escape, then God spares. In each case, He is working in the strict, strictest conformity with His known holiness. Thus, it, it was an answer. To trusting prayer, God said he would not allow the plague to ravage any longer. But he didn't say he would never bring it back. Do you understand? Um, Only eternity will reveal how fully, how much the plan of God has been wrought through consistent and persistent, and I'm going to say this again, prayer for salvation of souls in Israel and throughout the world. Uh, One of the things I think we sometimes don't realize is that prayer... Consistent, I'm going to say it again, consistent and persistent prayer avails much. God will do things and we won't. And I think one of the things we'll find out when we get to heaven, how much our prayers did, did God listen to and, and deal with things. The next one is consuming fire, verses 4 through 6. Um, Thus says the Lord God showed me... Uh, and behold, the Lord was calling to contend with them by fire, and it consumed the great deep and began to consume the farmland. So this fire, um, now when it says the deep, well, our first intention is to think the deep seas. What it's talking here more than anything is the deeps is talking about the water tables. The heat had gotten so bad, the drought had gotten so bad, it dried up the water tables. Um, that's kind of what you got to look at. Then, the Lord, then I said, Lord God, please stop. How can Jacob stand for he is small? And God again changed his mind about this. This too shall not be, he said. So again, the same cycle occurred. God pronounced judgment. He brought this scorching sun, uh, burns the fields uh, uh, and soaked up or, or basically got rid of the water table. He uh, And basically, as we look at devastation, was beginning to overtake the land. Uh, once again, Amos prays uh, or intercedes. I don't know if we want to call it necessarily a prayer. Some of us think of a prayer that's very um, structured. This is basically, Lord, please stop. <laughs> stop. Uh, a, a, a more, if not a prayer, more of a pleading for the people. And Lord, once again, relented. For, uh, the third vision is seven through nine. It says, Thus the Lord showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing by the vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. Um, and the Lord. Now, uh, do you guys know what a plumb line is? Okay. I'm sure some of you do. Uh, it's also called a plumb bob, I think. We used to call them plumb bobs. What it is, is it's a piece of string with a weight on it. And if you put it on a, a specific, in my case, it was, a, it was an instrument we used to use to set angles or to, or to 
or to locate things, you'd have a pipe in the ground, a, a po- and you want to get it right over that pipe, and the instrument had to be dead center over it. The way you'd use it is you hang this instrument called the plumb daub from it, bob, which is a string with a weight on it, and make sure it's dead center so as you leveled your level and got it all centered on that, it had to be dead center over that so you'd be straight down the line you wanted to shoot. So basically, it's, it's to level and keep things perfectly per- perfectly straight. That's what the idea is. Uh, so uh, whether you call it a plumb bob or cord with a weight or a plumb line, whatever you want to call it, it determines verticalness of the wall. Um, if you say anything, you say that weight would be perfectly straight. Obviously, a string is not going to have a bend in it. Uh, so the, what, the, what the Lord says is with a strict justice, I am going to cut this judgment straight. It's going to be perfect. And that's, what it, that's kind of what he's looking at. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a plumb line. And the Lord said, behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people. I will spare them no longer. So what he's saying is I'm going to put up a, a measurement. This is what I want. What does God want? He wants perfectness. He wants holiness. Do they measure up? How far do they measure away from that plumb line? And you'd say, man, they're way off. But God said, this is the only uh, line I have. This is the only thing I can be. I can only be perfect. And, and he's, he's going to measure that. So he places a plumb line in the, measure, in the, in the midst of the people. And, and basically the question is, how do they measure up? How do we measure up? What is the standard of perfection we use? How close are we to it? And we've got to say this like the people should have said. Not close, Lord. Not close, Lord. But he says, I will spare them no longer because they didn't measure up. And, and it's, it's interesting because as, as he says this in the end of verse uh, 8, he says, I will spare them no longer. I think some versions say I will pass over them no longer. An interesting under, a take, uh, a take on that because God had passed over at this time their sins. Remember in the Old Testament, he had covered them. It's not the same word, but it's just an interesting play on English words. That he passed over them. Um, verse 9 says, The high places of Isaac will be desolated. The sanctuaries of Israel will lay waste. And, they shall not, and, I sh- and then shall I rise up against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Um, we don't have Amos crying out and pleading out to stop. We don't have God relenting on this one. So basically what we see is this is carried out. And we know that Jeroboam... And 721 is cut off because Israel's taken into captivity. Um, Zechariah, the son of Jerob, uh, Jeroboam, was murdered by a conspirator. So not only is Jeroboam cut off, his house is cut off with a sword. His, his son is murdered. Um, the account of that is in First King, uh, 2 Kings 15, if you want to look at the historical account. Um, what we have here is an interlude between visions. We've done the first three visions, and then uh, we have an interlude here. It's called opposition to the prophet, and we'll kind of we're going to kind of. I think next week we can cover the rest of this and finish Amos. So we're going to cut it off for tonight because I'll never get through um, the end of verse nine, chapter nine. is very interesting, even though we covered by mistake already chapter eight verse eleven. <laughs> we'll have to go back and do it. Um, but here's what I want to pull away with tonight from this lesson. Um, and I think we need to see that through the prophets. That God doesn't let anything just go. At some point, God has a point that he deals with sin. And you're either going to deal with it through his son, the Messiah, who has dealt with sin. Or you're going to deal with your own sin and God will deal with them. And here he's using a nation as an example. Because he wants this nation to be redeemed. And since it's got such a fungus in it, he's got to do them in. And we will know this, that when God destroys this nation, there's just a remnant, a very few left. They will never reassemble together as a northern kingdom. So when Israel is reassembled, when God calls a nation from all the corners of the earth, and they come back into the promised land, they will be, when they reassemble, they will be Israel again, but they will never be what we know as the northern kingdom, they will be a united kingdom. So it's kind of interesting. Um, let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you for this time we've had. Um, 
As we go our separate ways tonight, Lord, keep us safe in this cold weather. Uh, the wind chill's getting down there. At the same time, we just thank you for uh, everything that's being done in this building, especially with our children and the Iwana program as they're uh, getting taught in the basics of the Christian life, Father. We thank you for all of those that are involved with that. In Jesus' name, amen.